I just knew that we didn't have people thinking about the water as a real life element that they could fish, they could want to travel, or just be on it. The, the infrastructure was falling to the water, the shipping was gone. So it became clear that sort of nobody was paying any attention to the waterfront. But the main point we made to them was, listen, we hardly understand this, but we can tell you one thing, you've got to get on it now. So we started doing interviews of various stakeholders, and very quickly we're hearing the same thing, which was the opportunity was huge. Uh, Paige and John then took it upon themselves to begin to lead the process that led to the independent incorporation of the Waterfront Alliance. So it really needed to spin off be its own organization to be the champion for the waterfront that it needed to be. And he felt like this was this undiscovered territory that um, for him, as someone who was you know, raised in New York City and lived there his whole life, he was just amazed by it and so excited to make sure that everybody had the opportunities to use the waterfront. But everybody had the same goal. We gotta teach people that being on the boat on the water is cool. And it's here and it's already paid for. All you gotta do is use it. Thanks to the meaningful involvement of a bunch of volunteers, you actually breathe the whole new generation of life into the organizations. So in the last 10 years, for me, I think the biggest accomplishment is that the Waterfront Alliance has raised the awareness that we have a waterfront here and that it is a resource of all the people. And I think with greater resources, we've expanded that and been able to implement many of those programs that were just an idea at the yeah. time. All the things we have today that we take for granted, um, I remember them not being part of my, um, uh, as a young man. So um, important, uh, one of the reasons to have organizations like the Waterfront Alliance. If you asked me five years ago, much less 25 years ago, would there ever be a ferry ru running uh, from the Bronx into the uh, Midtown, um, I would have laughed at you. And so we're starting to understand what we have available to us and how to really effectively use it and move people um, give them economic freedom, um, social freedom, in ways that we, um, I think we're blind to uh, for a long time. The foundation, collectively, a, a lot of us, we were very active in um, post-Katrina at New Orleans, helping them put together a, a cohesive plan. We started to build a broader framework for how we think about resilience. It's, it's not just about infrastructure, it's all those other things, social cohesion, all of those things become important if you want to build a holistically resilient city. That's when we came up with this idea of uh, 100 resilient cities. We had 11, over 1,100 cities applied for 100 spots, uh, everything from Greenwich, Connecticut to Mogadishu. So I can see Wedge becoming a platform partner somewhere down the road because having the Wedge guidelines as part of a conversation with stakeholders who are living near the harbor or building near the harbor becomes a, a a, a, a quite a natural uh, nexus that can be built on. We think it has real, uh, real legs. Hi, uh, I'm Don Capoche from BFC Partners, uh, here today on the waterfront of Schaefer Landing. It wasn't until we came to the site, this is many years ago, and we saw how at that time remote this was from the local, the, the, the closest subway stop. So as we were building this job, I noticed the water taxi, the New York water taxi passing by regularly. Uh, I got a hold of uh, Douglas Durst and Tom Fox and told them that I would like to try to arrange uh, with them some kind of limited service, at least while we were marking the job. We certainly weren't the first, but we were the first residential stop. We, we believe in the system that has now uh, been very much supported by the city and is uh, transporting, I, I think, thousands and thousands of people around the New York Harbor. The Waterfront Alliance in particular has and, and can continue to play a great role in securing public access to the waterfront, getting as many New Yorkers as possible, regardless of demographic, income, whatever, access to this great, these great waterfront opportunities would be, a, would be an exceptional achievement over but you know, we've really got a long way to go still 
if we're going to create the same levels of opportunity for everybody at the same income level, or regardless of income level, or regardless of language, and regardless of where you live. I want the waterfront to become as changed as the parks have, and be the kind of asset for this, for this city that the citizens demand that it doesn't go backwards. Uh, you know, maybe that is a big part of New York's future, when you look at the waterfront and the ability to move unobstructed from one borough to, to another over water. The, the settlement house kids that I care about, you know, these kids, they have no idea what water or the boats look like. They come down and their smiles are ear to ear to get on a boat trip and go out and wander around on the water on a boat. They're not gonna forget that tomorrow morning. Uh, in the next 10 years, I think John, um, or I know John would like to see uh, every kid able to take advantage of what the waterfront has to offer, um, like his daughters did. We've got a huge gap in the concept of the average citizen of how much of their life could be enjoyed, enhanced, enriched uh, by being on the water. A lot of the work that's gone into Wedge over the past five, eight years, it's really setting the stage for the next 10 years because now we're not just gonna be waterfront advocates and water users, we're gonna be water advocates and water users. And I think the challenge of the future is not just to get people on the water, but to get people in it.